Well, the greatest transformation, I believe, is what God does in us and how he changes us from what we were when we started to what he wants us to be. And it's a process. It's not something that happens all at once. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens over a period of time. And if you want to enjoy your journey with God, then you will have to be patient and realize that although you're not yet where you need to be, that God's not mad at you about that, that he loves you every step of the way. And the main thing I believe that God wants is for us to just keep pressing on and to be making some kind of progress. I don't know about you, but I like progress. I like to know that I'm getting somewhere, even if it's not everywhere that I would like to be, at least I'm getting somewhere. So we tell people, I've been telling them for years, you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. And, and I encourage you, now listen to me, I want to encourage you this morning to be excited about the growth that you've had. Don't be, don't always just be looking at what you're not, what you're not, what you're not. But really get excited and take some time sometimes and think about just the difference in you from when you started with God and where you're at now. How I many of you are a little bit nicer than you used to be? Okay. Thank God. So, the greatest tra transformation, I believe, is for a person to be selfish, self-centered, self-conscious, self-conceited, self-confident, <laughs> self-absorbed, and be turned into a Christ-like, unselfish child of God who walks in love. That's our goal, walking in love. Not the world kind of love that we turn on and off, dependent on what people do, but the agape of God, the kind of love that just loves because that's what it is. A good thing to pray is, God, reduce me to love. Let me be a body wholly filled and flooded with love. The greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think the Bible is a book largely about relationships. It's about our relationship with God, our relationship with people, but it's also a lot about our relationship with ourselves. And I don't know if you've noticed it yet or not, but a lot of the Bible talks about the way God wants us to see ourselves and the attitude that he wants us to have toward ourselves. God actually wants you to love yourself. Not in a selfish, self-centered way, but in a balanced, healthy way. He wants you to not be against yourself all the time and constantly finding everything that's wrong with you, but he wants you to see what he has created you to be and that although you've not arrived yet, you are on your way. Everybody say, I'm on my way. So I think to experience this kind of transformation, one of the things and, and the first thing that we need to do is we need to learn who we are in Christ and then begin to walk in that. Now, what do I mean when I say who we are in Christ? Well, when we're born again, we're put into Christ, and he comes to live in us. We become one. And so, him being in us, we now share in everything that he is, everything that he has, and everything that he's done by faith. Jesus is totally righteous. Nothing wrong with him. And do you know the Bible says that he that knew no, son, no sin, being Jesus, became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So in Christ, one of the things that we now have is rightness instead of wrongness. Isn't that wonderful? Let's look at Romans 3, 23. Since all have sinned and are falling short of the honor and the glory of God. I like that. 
It doesn't say that we've all sinned and did fall short. We are falling short <laughs> every day, every moment. We are falling short of the honor and the glory which God bestows and receives. All, everybody say all. How <laughs> many of you agree we've all sinned? Okay. But you know what? Not everybody knows, and even if they did know, they might have a hard time agreeing to the rest of this. So all are justified. That means made just as if you've never sinned. And made upright and in right standing with God, freely and gratuitously by His grace, His unmerited favor and mercy through the redemption which is provided in Christ Jesus. So, in Christ, we are made right with God. You know how wonderful and freeing it is to not have to constantly meditate on everything that's wrong with you? Am I the only one in the building that's excited about that? I mean, isn't that... My gosh, I did that for so many years. And you know, the world is full of people that are more than happy to tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> they put out all these standards and rules that we're supposed to follow and this is what we're supposed to do. I mean, even the magazines show us what we're supposed to look like. But you've got to remember that those are all airbrushed. <laughs> and they're little teenagers that don't have one ounce of body fat on them. And I don't know, excuse me, but I don't think Eve looked that way. I've decided to believe she had a little meat on her bones, amen? Now that's just my personal opinion, but, you know, there you have it. doesn't have much to do with what else I'm saying today, but it's still good. And when I say that we're righteous, I don't mean we do everything right. And that's the glory of this. We all are falling short <laughs> of the glory of God. You've already done wrong things this morning. I've already done wrong things. I had some kind of stupid thoughts earlier this morning. I mean, do you ever get into stupid in your head? It's like, and, and it's like you're just going around thinking stuff, getting ready, doing stuff, and then all of a sudden you're like, what? Why am I even thinking about that? So the Bible says that when we sin, we not only sin in behavior, but also in thought and word. Thought, word, and deed. So we might as well just give up the pressure of perfectionism and stop feeling like that God's going to reject us or be mad at us if we don't perform perfectly every day. Now somebody might say, well, Joyce, don't you think you're taking a chance in saying that to people? What if they just now think it's okay for them to sin. Well, you know what? I'm not the least bit worried about that, and I'll tell you why. If you love God enough to come out here this morning to hear his word on a Saturday morning, then you are not a person that's getting up every day looking for an excuse to sin. So I'm going to help you by telling you, yes, do your best and let God do the rest. And every day, you'll get better and better and better. Little by little, from glory to glory, we improve. Over the last 40, well, Dave and I have been married 48 years. And over the last 40 years, since I've been really seriously studying the Word of God, I mean, he honestly probably feels like he's been married to 20 different women. And I tell you what, I still have not arrived, but I am sure not like I used to be. And that's what the Word of God is supposed to do for us. Amen? We are transformed into His image. Amen? Our destination is Christ-likeness. And our destination is to respond to people and things and situations the way that Jesus did when He was here. Thank God that the world is not our standard, but Jesus is our standard. So I love that, that we are falling short. It's not just a one-time thing. I didn't just like get all messed up, but now I've, now I've got it all together. 
We are falling short of the glory of God, but we are all justified and made right with God through Christ. In Him. Not in my behavior. I don't do everything right, but I still am right. And here's the reason why this is so important. Now please listen, you're never going to produce anything that you don't believe you have. So how foolish would it be, and this is many times what people do. You got to do this, you got to do this, you need to do this, you need to do that. That's what religion, just raw religion without relationship does to us many times. Loads us down with rules and regulations and all of these guidelines about behavior that never gets around to telling us who we are in Christ. Amen? If I don't know that I have something, I can't produce it. If you said to me, give me a dollar, I couldn't give you a dollar if I didn't know that I had a dollar. So how can you ever have better, how can you ever produce more right behavior if you don't know that you are right and that that seed of rightness is in you as a gift from God? So I want everybody to say, I've got it. <laughs> and this is what we need to know. We've got it. We've got what it takes. We're full of everything that we need and it's just working its way from deep inside of us to outside of us where everybody can see it. <laughs> this is a happy day, happy day, happy day. Okay. We are loved. Wow. So many people desperately need to not only hear that, but believe it. I've said several times in this conference, God is never going to love you any more than he does at this moment right now. You might think, no. Oh. Because see, sometimes we think, well, if we improve, then God will love us more. God doesn't love us because of anything we do. He loves us because that's who he is. God is love. And he loves us with everlasting love with a perfect love that is unconditional and cannot be bought. Can I tell you something today? God is not for sale, and you cannot buy him with your good works. Amen? It's free grace. God loves us not because we deserve it, but because he has to do that. That's just what he does. And so, even if you just are having a really hard time getting a hold of how God could love you, just receive it and let that love begin to heal the wounds in your life. You know, as you know, I was sexually abused by my dad. At least you know it if you've watched my TV program. And went on for many years. And I talk about it a lot because it was the, the cause of so many wounds in my life that needed to be healed. Children are meant to be loved and, and cared for and, and to get to laugh and to play and to, to be nurtured. And I didn't get any of that. The people who told me that they loved me abandoned me, abused me. My dad was angry all the time. Every time you didn't do exactly what he wanted, he was angry. You never knew from one day to the next what he expected. So even if you thought you had it figured out on Tuesday, it might change on Wednesday. And the whole goal, it seemed like for years, was just to try to dance around him and try to keep him from getting mad. Because if he got mad, you never knew what he was going to do. I mean, sometimes he'd beat my mother up or rant and rave and scream and yell. You just never knew. And so by the time you have about 15 years of that, you're messed up. Then I married the first guy that came along when I was 18 because I thought since I'd been abused, nobody would ever want me. So, I, you know, I didn't know what love was. I'd never seen any. So I just married the first guy that came along, and he was just a nutcase. And, you know, I say this a lot. Very often, people that are hurt and troubled out of desperation marry other troubled people. Why well, we got to be careful about making decisions in desperation? 
You know, you would be better off to be by yourself than to be with the wrong person. Trust me on that. Amen? So five years I was married to him. And he would leave me, he would abandon me in other states. And I'd have to call somebody at home to get some money to... I got abandoned in Mexico. I got abandoned in California. Here I'm 18 and I've been through already a, a lifetime of hell and now I've got five more years of it and all this is love. <laughs> he'd get tired of being out by himself and he'd show up again in the middle of the night. Oh, I love you. I'm so sorry. And I was dumb enough to keep believing it time after time after time. Why? Why? Because I was desperate for love. If there's anything that we want and need, it's love. And not some kind of a perverted worldly kind of love, but a love that says, I love you the way you are. That doesn't mean that maybe we don't need to change, but... You know, one of the best things about my husband is he just lets me be me. And sometimes the version of me is not as great as some other times. <laughs> I'm a little mouthy, a little snippy, got a little fire in me. And he actually says that that's why he married me. He likes that fire, so I just give it to him so he's happy. <laughs> But how many of you just get so tired of trying to be what you think everybody wants you to be and then they're still never satisfied? But God is not like that. He likes you. He likes your big feet. He likes the space in your teeth. He likes everything about you. Every single thing about you. Things that other people think are flaws, he thinks are cute. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 3, 17 and 18. <laughs> and see, here's the thing. The more that you know that God loves you, the more amazed you're going to be. And that is going to cause you to want to change more than anything else could ever make you want to change. It's knowing that God loves you. The Bible says the love of Christ constrains us. So that means it's the love of God that causes us to discipline ourselves and to not make those wrong choices that we know would go against the will of God. Let me tell you something. I do a lot of things because I love Jesus that I would have never thought that I would have been able to do. Amen? I mean, I put up with some people that I would have never thought that I would have been willing to put up with. And I don't do it because I want to. I don't do it because it's fun. I don't do it because I like it. I don't do it because they deserve it. I do it because I love Jesus. And I love him because he first loved me. I spent a year, not a day or two days or a week, I spent a year studying meditating on and confessing that God loved me. A year. And let me tell you something, if you don't have that revelation, then you might as well just take a break from everything else. You don't need to study anything else. And you need to just study and focus on and read everything you can get your hands on about how much God loves you. And that he's never going to quit on you. He's never going to give up on you. God's not mad at you every time you make a mistake. Amen? Amen? In Ephesians 3, wherever that's at in here, it says, May Christ, through your faith. So you have to realize that all that I'm talking about this morning comes through faith. You don't get it if you don't believe it. That's why we started on Thursday night saying, Dare to believe. May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts, and may you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that you might have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love. We can actually experience 
the love of God. You can learn to recognize that's God loving me. God did that for me. That's a wink from God. That's God letting me know that He sees me and that He loves me. Well, God's unconditional love for us definitely will change our lives. And it also gives us a desire to discipline ourselves and make right decisions according to the Word of God. We all need to change, but sometimes it's difficult to go through change. So today we're offering you four CDs called How to Survive Change. Trust me, if you're going through a difficult time right now and you feel like everything is shaking around you, including you, you will get through it and you will be better on the other side. This is a lot of good word that we're offering you today, so make sure you get yours and start to study right away. My mom was an alcoholic. She could be a very mean drunk. As Joy says, I never felt safe in my home growing up. One of my mom's favorite things to do was to send us to our room for the weekend, and uh, we couldn't come out, no food. And I remember having a uh, basket with a rope on it that I would drop out of my second story window and uh, had an older neighbor boy that lived behind us right up the hill that kind of knew a little bit what was going on, and he'd sneak sandwiches up to us over the weekend. Uh, this one particular night, he talked his mom into coming down and rescuing us, if you will, so that we could have a, a meal in a warm house. Uh, she kind of you know, tucks me in, in bed in, in the, the same room where her son was. And uh, when he... Uh... I started last year praying for what I call the gift of awareness. Here's the thing that I pray for. God, I don't want to miss you. I don't want you doing a bunch of outstanding stuff in my life and me thinking it's accidents or not even really getting what's going on. You know, we need to be aware of what God's doing and not unaware of what God's doing. I believe that God is doing stuff for all of you all the time and you just maybe haven't learned how to pay attention to it. I'm saying to the Lord one day, God, why don't you do the same kind of stuff that you used to do? He said, Joyce, I do things all the time. You've just gotten used to it. <laughs> That's why even when I'm in these conferences, and I have done thousands of these, this may be new to you, but I've been doing this for years and years. And I purposely realize that the presence of God is here. I take, we're not just here in a room today to see the lady on TV. The presence of God is in this room today. And if you know anything at all about atmosphere and what it can feel like when it's full of wickedness, and what it feels like when it's full of God, then you know that you are in a good place today. And here's something else that's just going to really get you. You are holy. Hmm. Mike's the only one that agreed. Okay. Hebrews 10. Verse 10. Because see, here's what we think. Well, if I'm so holy, why do I act so unholy? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you. Hebrews 10.10. 10. And in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy. <laughs> Not we will be, we hope to be, we have been. Come on, let's... Don't let your mind cave in. We have been made holy, consecrated and sanctified through the offering made once and for all of the body of Jesus Christ. So we're not made holy by our own behavior. We're made holy by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ if we believe in Him. But you know what? It's not good enough just to believe in Him. There are many other things that we need to believe. We need to believe that we've been made right with God. We need to believe that we've been made holy. We need to believe that God loves us because we don't receive anything that Jesus did for us if we don't 
personally believe it. Secondhand faith is not going to work. It doesn't work for you just because your mama believes it. Or just because your grandmama believes it. Or your friend believes it. You need to ask yourself, what do you believe? Do you believe, even in your darkest hour, that God loves you unconditionally and has a good plan for your life? Do you believe, when you have acted your worst, that you still are the righteousness of God in Christ? And that's when you need to believe it. Not on your pretty days. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering... I love this one. He has forever completely <laughs> cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. Forever completely. Forever completely. Forever completely. <laughs> Everybody say, I've got it. it. Woo. And you know, you got power. Hold your head up and put those shoulders back and go out like you mean it. God lives in you. Whoa! You're the house of God. Well, Monday, I sure wish it was Friday. No, get out there and live Monday. Live Tuesday, live Wednesday, live Thursday. It doesn't have to be Friday for you to be happy. Well, I'll sure be glad when I go on vacation. Why can't we be glad now instead of some other time? See, I believe the thing that Jesus offers us is the ability to really enjoy ordinary, everyday, sometimes humdrum, boring, everyday life. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you, <laughs> not I will give you, I have given you power. <laughs> I have given you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. given you. Somebody say, I've got it. <laughs> now, in addition to that, the Bible says we're justified. We're seated in heavenly places. So, I live in two places. My feet are on this platform, but spiritually, I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. I'm free, forgiven, wise, God's peace is ours through Jesus Christ, and on and on and on and on. So, you can never produce something that you don't know that you have. So I took way too long on point one. <laughs> All right, now. Well then, if I'm so holy and in such good shape, why do I act so bad? <laughs> well, we're in a process of what's in us being worked to the outside of us. So how can my behavior and my, contact, my conduct change? Well, in Zechariah, there's some scriptures that you probably recognize part of this. It says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. You familiar with that? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And what was going on there was they were trying to finish a temple, and they had gotten so far, and things were kind of uh, hindered and blocked and they were wanting to finish the temple how can we finish and the word of the Lord came not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts so God comes along and he does this amazing thing in us free we feel all this good stuff and then we get so far and then nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And so we get like Abraham and Sarah, we get a plan. <laughs> we get a bright idea. Well, this is what I need to do. Now, it's one thing to do something because you feel like the Holy Spirit is leading you to do it. 
But if it's, this is what I'm going to do, it never works. It never works. You just wear yourself out on what the Bible calls works of the flesh. Amen? One of the best examples I know is when I started hearing messages about the power of words. Well, I was convicted, to say the least, because I had a very large mouth that worked pretty much constantly. <laughs> See, when you have a gift in something, it can also be your greatest fault. Honey, I can talk. Amen? And uh, so, boy, when I would first start hearing these messages about the power of words, the power of life and death is in the tongue, you know, because I was always hearing, you shouldn't have said that, you shouldn't have said that, you shouldn't have said that. Why did you say that? So I would hear these messages and I would go like, that's it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I had my plan for holiness and good behavior. And so then, but because the flesh is out of balance all the time, I wouldn't say nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. -huh. So then pretty soon people be saying, What is your problem? And then I would think, that's it. You're not happy if I talk, you're not happy if I don't talk. Come on now. And the other thing that I didn't understand, and this I think will help you, the quieter I would be on purpose the more depressed I would feel. And I thought, what is this? I'm trying to do what I believe God wants me to do. Why do I feel so depressed? And this is what God said. You've shut your mouth, but nothing's changed on the inside. See, I was trying to conform myself to the image but the Bible says be not conformed but be ye transformed by the entire renewal of your mind I was never going to change what I said if I didn't let God work with me on changing what I thought we're changed by God's grace not our works and effort you say well what is my part I'm supposed to do something here it comes Four things. Believe. to believe God is changing me I want God to change me I've asked God to change me I want to be what he wants me to be and I believe that God is working and that I'm getting better and better all the time I actually believe that God changes us in such minute little degrees that we don't really see it or recognize it that's why sometimes you have to look back to how you were 10 years ago and then say wow God really has done a work so first thing believe second thing study God's word now I didn't say read the Bible that's cool do that too but I'm talking about studying the word of God even if it's 30 minutes a day even if you start with 15 minutes a day study don't get into the Bible for quantity, look at it for quality. Stick with it till you can say, okay, I learned something today. I saw something that encouraged me. Don't just go through it at warp speed and then feel proud of yourself because you read three or four chapters if you can't remember one thing you read. Amen? Get in a Bible study. Study the Word. It's great to hear preachers I'm glad you watched my program. I'm really glad you came to the conference. But I want you to study. And we have things to help you. And don't use the excuse, I can't understand the Bible. 
There's too many modern translations of the Bible for anybody to say they can't understand it, and there's too many uh, other uh, books and things to help you study. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being <laughs> transfigured into His very own image in ever-increasing splendor from one degree of glory to another. So, how are we changed? From looking into the Word of God. We see in the Word what Jesus is. We see what we're not. We say, God, I want that to change. Will you help me? Will you work in me? And then God goes to work. Amen? Now, God has a few tools that He uses that we're not always very fond of. Oh, God, help me love everybody. Help me, Lord, even love the unlovely. Also, do you think that's going to happen then by God just surrounding you with lovely people? If you want to learn how to love the unlovely, then you're going to have to be around some unlovely people. Come on. Oh, God, help me be patient. You just asked for a problem. Amen? So, on and on. You get it. James 1.21. I love this scripture. James 1.21. So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness. And in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. That doesn't mean the power to be born again. You're already born again. Your spirit is all fixed up. Honey, you got it. It's the soul that needs to be saved now. My mind, my will, my emotions. God is working his way out of our spirit, out through our soul, and finally out through our body where the world can get some benefit out of what Christ has done in our life. Approach the word respectfully with a humble spirit. I need this. I need this. Mike and Penny Shepherd. Penny's been sitting under my teaching for over 30 years, 32, 33 years. And uh, so that's a long time to hear somebody. And she's... here, she takes notes, she gets excited, she acts like she's never heard it before, and she said, I always hear something new. I always hear something new. And one of the things that I really appreciate about her is what she hears, she'll try to put it to practice in her life. You see, we got to get over just going to a meeting, just to go to a meeting. You know, you're wasting your time to come if you don't intend to go home and do. See, here's the thing. You may have found out this weekend that you've got some problems you didn't know you had when you came in. But now, guess what? Now you're accountable. We get a different kind of grace when we're ignorant. 
But when you're knowledgeable, so that, and that doesn't mean you have to go home and try to change, but it means you go home and you get serious with God now and say, okay, I was really convicted this weekend about this area in my life. My God, I don't want to stay like this. You had me there for a purpose. I want to change. I want to grow. So I believe you can change me. I'm going to study your word in that area. If you've got a bad temper, you don't need to study prosperity. <laughs> Hello? If you've got a big mouth, you don't need to study promotion. <laughs> Take the word like medicine. If I have a headache, I don't put a band-aid on my head. And that's what some Christians do. It's like they're just a, a nightmare at home. And they go to some meeting on, I don't know, something, end times. You know, we'll pick that. Well, that's good being informed, but you know what? Man, do you have to worry that much about if it's going to be post-trib or pre-trib -trib and is there a rapture and isn't there a rapture? I mean, people say to me, well, what do you think? I just think we all ought to be ready every day in case he comes back. Sometimes, honestly, I think if we're that concerned about when it's going to happen, then maybe we're not planning to get ready until a week before it happens. <laughs> He'd come now for all I care. I'm just as ready now as I will be in 20 years from now. Because the only way I'm getting in is Jesus. Yeah. Study things you need. Study love. Study the fruit of the Spirit. You should see me try to sell a teaching series on pride. <laughs> Ain't nobody buying that. <laughs> And the people who need it certainly wouldn't buy it because they would be too proud to think that somebody might see them get it and think they needed it. Okay. Time with God. You've got to have time with God. Time with God. Spend time with God. Put God first. Work the rest of your schedule around Him. Start with five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. But go somewhere, get by yourself, get a good book, get a Bible, have nothing but just you and God, but spend time with God. Because here's the bottom line, no matter what anybody else teaches you, he's the one that's got to put it all together and make it work in your life. And then learn to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Joyce, what about discipline, self-control, making right choices, doing what's right, whether you feel like it or not? Well, that's all part of it, too. See, the thing I like about this is this whole restoration thing, there's a lot of parts. There's the part that only God can do. There's the part he expects me to do. There's his grace, and I can't do anything without that. And now here's a scripture that just makes you want to scream. Colossians 3.5. This might not be...
good parting scripture, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> so kill, deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members, <laughs> those animal impulses and all that's fleshy in you. Anyway, on and on and on, on basically says kill the flesh. Well, you say, now wait a minute, I like that grace part better. I like that part about God doing it for me. I like that believing part, that's okay, but this kill a thing, I don't like that. What does that mean? Okay, well, it doesn't mean you take a club and try to beat something out of yourself. Here's the best way to kill something, don't feed it. You know what happens if you don't feed it? It'll die. Anytime that you're used to something, whether it's self-pity or reasoning or fear or worry, when you first start not giving in to it, you are going to S-U-F-F-E-R. <laughs> I thought you might handle it better if I spelled it. <laughs> In case you didn't get it, it's suffer. <laughs> Nobody wants to suffer, but I'm going to tell you what. You're going to have to be uncomfortable sometimes for a while. All right, I'm going to try them here. <laughs> You're going to have to be uncomfortable sometimes for a while. It's not eternal. But you're going to have to be uncomfortable sometimes for a while. And just let your flesh have a fit. But just say to your flesh, I'm not feeding you. Same thing when I knew that I wanted to quit smoking cigarettes. And I started smoking when I was nine years old and smoke, 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 smoke. And when I started teaching the Bible and hiding from people smoking my cigarettes, I thought maybe that needed to change. <laughs> not that smoking is any worse than a lot of other stuff. Matter of fact, the Bible says a lot more about not overeating than it does a lot of the stuff that we make the biggies. <laughs> well, I wish I had about another hour to come after you guys. Now listen. Now, you know what? It makes me mad when some people get it easy and I got to suffer. Dave wanted to quit smoking, because we both smoked, and he said, well, I'm just going to smoke till God takes away the desire. He got up the next day and said, I don't want to smoke anymore. <laughs> well, honey, not me, I had to suffer. So see, not everybody even gets it the same way. Well, why couldn't I have had a breakthrough like that? Why didn't you give me a miracle? Well, honestly, although I didn't know then, I do know now, I really believe that God takes me the long, hard route sometimes just so I can personally understand what you're going through and be able to minister to you in a way that really makes sense to you. And I was very uncomfortable. First few days it was terrible. Then after a week got a little better. After two weeks got a little better. After 30 days, I didn't have a problem with smoking anymore. I was uncomfortable for a while, but now I've been free for 40 years. So, you can get free from anything if you're willing to believe, study, spend time with God, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and be willing if God leads you the hard, long way to let your flesh go ahead and not be comfortable for a while because you will come out on the other side.
hypnotized What's up is down, what's left is right Chasing stars and holding view I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Keep the sky on your mind 